Thank you very much, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for coming out. Surprise. I'm going to talk about surprise, right? So what does surprise mean? Well, I'm a professor of statistics, and if I had to boil statistics down to one sentence, I would say it's judging when an outcome is surprising. When should we be surprised? So the sort of classic example that people use in statistics is they might do, let's say, a medical test. And you say, we're giving some treatment to people, and we think maybe it helps. It helps them to reduce disease, helps them to get better, helps them to be more healthy. How do we test it? Well, you get a, uh, some test subjects, right? And you conduct a medical test, and you give some people the treatment and some not, and you compare the results. And if you're a statistician, the question would always be, how much better do they do? So you could say, well, the treatment's beneficial. That means it actually significantly improved the outcome. But the question is, what does it mean to be significant? If things just improve it a tiny bit, well, there's always going to be luck and randomness. Maybe it doesn't mean anything. But then you say, well, maybe it's significant. So to be significant, it has to um, be significant. It can't just be sure to chance. I would say it has to be surprising. It has to be, wow, look, these people did better. Surprise. And if you get a surprise, that means you've proven something. So I want to talk about surprise in some different contexts. Let me start with a true story. So back when I was 14, my family went on a trip to Disney World. Maybe that's surprising. That's not so surprising, right? But while we were there, we ran into my father's cousin, Phil. And he lived in Connecticut, and we lived here in Ontario. And we didn't know he was going to Florida, and, you know, he didn't know we were going to Florida. And suddenly, look, there he is. Surprise, right? <laughs> so you say surprise. And you say, well, at the time, there were about 230 million people in the United States, and we saw my dad's cousin, Phil. What's the chance? Well, maybe it's one chance in 230 million, right? Surprise, it's incredible, right? Then you stop and think, well, but wait, and this is the first time I thought about sort of probability or statistical idea, I said, but wait. First of all, we didn't just see one person while we were at Disney World, right? We saw, and you can see in the photograph, lots of people go to Disney World. There's lots of lineups and crowds and so on. We probably saw at least several thousand people uh, that we saw, let's say, close enough that if they'd been my father's cousin Bill, we would have recognized them, right? So it wasn't maybe one chance out of 230 million. It was a few thousand chances out of 230 million. Still a surprise, right? Then you say, but wait, my dad's cousin Phil, he wasn't the only person we would have been surprised to see, right? What about my dad's other cousins, or my mom's cousins, or my cousins, or my next door neighbor, or my best friend from elementary school? There's all sorts of people we would have been surprised to see at Disney World. So really what happened is, out of the thousands of people that we saw, one of them was one of the hundreds of different people that we would have been surprised to see. So when you put it that way, maybe it's not such a surprise, right? And, uh, <laughs> and I, I worked this out in my book, and I say when you put all those factors together, there was something like one chance in 200 that when you take a trip to Disney World for a couple of days, at some point you will run into somebody completely unexpectedly. Still a surprise, right? But not such a huge surprise. And then you think, well, over a lifetime, you're going to go on lots of trips, you're going to meet lots of people, you're going to go lots of places. You might well, over a lifetime of traveling and experiences, run into someone completely unexpectedly. And you might be thinking, well, has it happened to you? And sometimes I give talks and I'll ask people, you know, by a show of hands, who has some experience like this? And almost always, over half the audience says, yeah, you know, this time I was traveling and this happened to me. So is it a surprise? Well, it was sure a surprise to us, right? So there's a subjective sense, yeah, that was a surprise. But then you say, well, is it surprising that this will happen at some point in our lives that we'll see somebody? And the answer is actually no. So sometimes a surprise isn't a surprise, or at least there's a way to think about it, which makes it not a surprise. So let me tell you another story. This is, so I do a fair bit of things in media and so on, for you know, news and uh, documentaries and so on. And one time, it was just, I guess, uh, last year, this uh, documentary people came up to me and they said, hey, we, you know, we'd like to interview you. We know you write about things like uh, coincidences and probabilities. We've got a story for you. We want to interview you. Okay, fine. What's the story? Well, here's the story. Concerns these two people here. And the story is they were both on a beach in Hawaii. They didn't know each other. One of them ended, uh, they ended up sort of chatting because one of them offered to take a photograph of the other one with his family. They both recognized their accents were from Massachusetts. You know, hey, where are you from? Oh, hey, have you been to this town? Hey, do you know so and so? They say, well, what about this guy? Uh, do you know him? Wait a minute, he was my father, one of them says. The other said, wait a minute, he was my father. Okay? <laughs> 
Now, these two had never met, but they were half brothers, right? So they were of different ages. The father had started two different families. The father was long deceased, and yet they met, right, on a beach in Hawaii. Surprise, right? <laughs> what a story, right? You think they, 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 how could they meet on a beach? And of course, the media loves this kind of thing, right? It's like, wow, what a great story. And it so happened that the uh, younger one, the one on, on your right, um, he'd been going through a rough time, actually, and turned out he could really use a helping hand, and he got to know this other half-brother in their family, and it really turned his life around. So even better, right? The surprising meeting on the beach, and turns his life around. Well, you know, it's, it's amazing, right? And so then people say, well, what does it mean, right? So they want to interview me about this, you know, what, what can I say about this? What does it mean? Well, what do I say? So, first of all, is it a striking story? Well, yeah, you know, you understand why the media wants to write articles about this. Second of all, you say, is it a heartwarming story? Well, as it happens, it is, because as I say, it turned one of their lives around, it was this important meeting of these half-brothers, you know, changed everything just because they met on a beach in Hawaii. But then you say, well, first of all, was it significant for them? Yeah, for sure, it changed, changed their life. Surprise, right? <laughs> then you say, did it have deeper meaning? And the show that was interviewing me was called Supernatural Investigator. <laughs> <laughs> they thought it had a deeper meaning, right? And the exact deeper meaning is hard to pin down, but you know, it's a cosmic fate, it's the guiding hand of God, it's, you know, uh, their destiny, it's what was uh, deemed what had to happen to them, right? And they say, you know, what do you think, Professor? Right? And so, of course, the interviewer says, yeah, that has a deeper meaning. I say, no, I'm sorry, but I don't think it does. And again, I have to be careful because is it important for them for sure? Is it an interesting story for sure? But I, I don't think it has a deeper meaning. And so, you know, we try to go through a little calculation or try to be rational about it. And, well, uh, so I say that'll happen from time to time by chance. And in particular, what about all the other people? So I did just a rough calculation. I figured there's probably something like a million people in the United States where this happened who are somehow estranged from their family or somehow have family members that, you know, uh, that either they don't know or they haven't seen in a long time. And if they did happen to run into them on the beach, it might well have a, a huge impact and change their life. So one of those, they met on the beach and it made a great story. What about the other million? And if you think of it that way, you're saying, okay, out of a million people approximately who could have had this amazing story, one of them had it. One in a million, that's left. Very important for them, sure, a good surprise for them, but should we be surprised that something like this happens sometime? No. And should we conclude something from it about guiding hands and so on? I would say no. So, so far I've talked about not surprising, right? <laughs> I mean, it'd be a bit of false advertising if I said never be surprised, right? I don't want to say that. I want to talk about things that are surprising too, and in particular, I want to talk for the rest of the time about a particular surprising story that I don't want to say happened to me, but let's say that I was involved in that uh, was quite dramatic in a way. And it's something you might have heard about. And it was this lottery retailer scandal. And so well, maybe I'll just tell the story as it unfolded. So it started with this guy named Bob Edmonds, who was um, a kindly older gentleman from Cobacon, Ontario. And in 2001, he was defrauded out of a quarter million dollar lottery win. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, what happened is he had his lottery tickets like he bought every week. He went to his local convenience store like he does every week. He says, hey, here's my ticket. You know, I didn't check it. Uh, can you tell me if I won anything? They looked and said, oh, no, you didn't win anything this week. He walked away. The store owner kept the ticket, cashed it for $40 million. Got away with it at first, but there were some questions raised. And then when Mr. Edmonds heard about it, he recognized those as the numbers that he normally played. He told people. At first, they didn't believe him. There was a whole long discussion and investigation. Finally, after several years, they, uh, they acknowledged that he was right. They paid him some of the money back and they made a settlement, but he had to not talk about it. There was sort of a hush order, gag order. He's like, okay, we don't want this getting out. CBC, Fifth Estate, an investigative program, they heard about this. They said, why are they trying so hard to hush this up? Maybe there's more to the story. So the CBC asked me, they said, is it possible that there's been other stories like this too? Well, I don't know, right? I don't even buy lottery tickets. How do I know if there's been another story like this? They said, well, we have some data. They said, here's the data they had, and even getting this data was kind of hard, but they said over a certain period of time, about seven years, of the major lottery wins, that is the ones for $50,000 or more, there were a total of about 5,700 such prizes in all the different lotteries in Ontario over that period, of which just about 200 of them were claimed as being won by people who worked in stores selling lottery tickets. 
Now, there may have actually been more. There was some evidence that maybe they didn't even record all the ones who were excuse me, working in stores. But let's just say, okay, there were about 200. And then, of course, the question is, is that too many, right? Is it surprising? Is it surprising that 200 of these lottery winners would have won? Well, I had to look at it, right? I had to say, well, you know, how many different lottery stores are there and how many people work there? And, um, you know, uh, uh, how often do they buy lottery tickets themselves? Did, I, uh, did they buy more than other people and so on? And I put it all together and I said, you know, yes, this is actually surprising. So I told them and I was, you know, I was doing a lot of media at the time. I thought, okay, here's one more media thing. And they said, okay, great. We're going to broadcast it on a certain uh, Wednesday in October. Okay, fine. So I went to bed Tuesday night and I knew Wednesday night they were going to broadcast it. I had no idea what a big story this was going to be. Now, again, some of you may have heard of it, but certainly if you were around then, you would have heard it because it was the front page news in the Globe and Mail that morning before it had even been broadcast. They got an advance news. It was in all the major newspapers. It was in the Sun. It was in the Star. It was in the Globe and Mail editorial, which uh, this one was my favorite because I also mentioned the title of my book, which is always good, right? But, um, <laughs> so it was everywhere. And they thought, you know, wow, boy, this is a big media story. And it you know, led all the news uh, casts and so on. And then, the Ontario government launched a, uh, an investigation by the Ontario Ombudsman. And he came back and he was scathing and he said, $100 million have been paid to unscrupulous retailers and the OLG, the, the, the lottery company, was turning a blind eye and so on. There was political scandal. There was debate in the legislature. You know, Mr. Speaker, a uh, professor of statistics at the University of Toronto says that this is unlikely and so on. And there was a lot of pressure and all the customers were outraged. The government had to react. So they reacted by firing the CEO of the lottery company, right? That's how they <laughs> dealt with it. So somebody got fired because of this little calculation I'd done, right? Um, that wasn't the end of it. Um, the lottery, though, they introduced new rules. And in fact, you may know now, before you cash your ticket, you're supposed to sign it is one of the rules, right? And that's supposed to make sure that you get your credit for it. Somebody tells me, every time he signs this stupid lottery ticket, he thinks of me, right? So, anyway, so that was a change. Um, the, uh, all right, the scandal spread to other places. So, for example, British Columbia, they did their own investigation of the lotteries there. And they heard that, you know, we in Ontario, we fired the CEO of our lottery, so they had to fire the CEO of their lottery too, right? Um, which they did for an investigation. In California, there was a whole sting operation that they set up where they, uh, you know, brought fake, uh, you know, actors posing as customers into stores and gave people an opportunity to steal it, and some of them did, right? Um, but, but, but then it became a police investigation, right? It was incredible. And, uh, they were launching an investigation. And I thought, well, you know, the statistics said that there were quite a few people who had won unfairly. But it didn't say which ones, right? So I wasn't sure they were going to find it out. But the police and their uh, their agents went through all the data and so on. And they eventually found, it was like a year or two later, they found a retailer. They said there was a $5.7 million ticket that they'd actually kept. And after much uncovering, they found out that actually it belonged to somebody else. He eventually confessed. He spent a year in jail. In jail and uh, the money was repaid. Later, there was another one for $80,000, where again, someone was charged and the money was repaid. And then, most dramatically, there was one case that had been identified in the Ombudsman's report as being suspicious, where somebody had won $12.5 million, right? And it seemed like maybe they, they had not won it fairly. And sure enough, they were charged, and uh, they, they, uh, uh, they eventually went to prison. And they weren't too happy about it. But uh, <laughs> more importantly, they said uh, police are seeking the rightful winner, right? And it sort of blew mine. They're like, fun page news. Hey, anybody wins $12.5 million, right? <laughs> and uh, incredibly, they got a lot of calls, right? A flurry of calls. Yeah, I think that might have been mine. I think I was cheated. I think maybe I won and so on. They tried to sort through it. And for several months, nothing happened. And then eventually, um, you know, there's a question. Could they really figure out out of all these people who thought they might have won, who was the real one? And eventually, they found them. And there was a group of seven men who got to share well, 12.5 million plus interest. You can see that's up to, up to 14.85 million. So it had been a few years. A lot of interest, right? Um, so anyway, they found them too. So that was repay too. So, so when I look back on it all, I think, you know, I'm sort of amazed that I was kind of involved in this story. And, but also that it all kind of happened from thinking about what's surprising, right? And something that seemed really surprising, like running into my dad's cousin at Disney World. Well, when you think about it, you know, it's not so surprising that something like that would happen. Something that seems not so dramatic, like 200 out of, uh, out of uh, 5,700 of these wins were by people who worked in stores, doesn't sound that surprising. But when you do the statistics, it was, and it led to a lot of stuff. So if there's one thing I can say about thinking statistically or probabilistically about the world, when something seems surprising, or even if it doesn't seem surprising, stop and think, is it really surprising or not?